Good evening, everyone. I am Yusuf Hashmi from Team Taxman, and I welcome you all to today's live webinar on FEMA from the auditor's perspective. But before we proceed, I shall take this opportunity to briefly introduce Taxman. We are India's leading publisher of tax and corporate laws, committed to del delivering our users the most authentic and enriching experience. Our goal is to simplify the research and compliance for the legal community. Our unwavering dedication to our vision has driven us to work tirelessly over the past six decades, providing innovative solutions that help our clients grow their tax practice and achieve new heights. And now everyone, please welcome our esteemed speaker, Ms. Nikki Shah. She is a highly experienced business consultant and C-suite advisor who operates from a unique vantage point of combining her experience as an investment banker, chartered accountant, business advisor, and registered valuer. Her expertise includes helping companies raise capital, <laughs> getting their finances and compliances in order, and creating value in their businesses. She is also a passionate speaker, presenter, and content creator, having spoken at various conferences and events. Her favorite topics include creating values from ideas, making companies investor ready. Welcome, Ms. Shah. It is our pleasure to have you with us. Before we begin, here are a few tips for the audience. Your mic will be on mute during the session. However, you can post your queries in the chat box provided. The speaker will answer your queries either during or after the session. A copy of this presentation will be sent to you via email for future reference. So without further ado, I would request Ms. Shah to address the audience. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yusuf. Uh, it is always a pleasure to have a session with taxmen because the people attending are also very intelligent and uh, we're trying to make this session as much more live and uh, we'll be trying to also answer all the questions as possible. Uh, today's session is going to be from 5 to 6. So we'll try and finish it by 5.50 and have last 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, feel free to post your questions. Uh, today's topic is pretty interesting. It is, uh, we've been learning about FEMA over the years and I've also been uh, coaching a number of times on the FEMA laws. Because FEMA is something which is there in India, but it has taken various shapes over the time. Uh, prior to 2008, pri uh, specifically being you know in the 90s era, FEMA was more of a draconian law, having more repercussions. Then it changed its color, became more liberal. And then after 2000, it became more liberal to allow people to flow in money. And uh, you were penalized. Only if your intention to do law, uh, intention to defy law was there. Uh, further, uh, as I said, you know, the intentions were uh, uh, brought forth by the government since the uh, 2000 beginning. But yet there were a lot of complications that were happening when you made default. Over the past couple of years, RBI and government have try been trying to further streamline that and make sure that if you are, you know, making any technical a uh, mistake or you are intentionally doing something which is not allowed by the law, then they have very high and very strict replications and penalties. But otherwise, if you have uh, not defaulted or sorry, if you have defaulted and you have made mistakes in terms of regular compliances, they have tried to um, ease out the process of uh, penalty, though the penalties are good enough. Uh, but yes, at least from the SSE's perspective, at least from the company's perspective, what they've tried is to ease it, make it faster, make it easier, uh, so that people can be more compliant. Uh, that's about FEMA. But again, uh, how as an auditor of a particular company or of a particular transaction, it is important for us to make sure that we know what we need to look at. Because as I always say, Auditors have that eyes who see things which are required to be seen and are hidden between, uh, beneath the carpet in a company's balance sheet or in the organization or in a transaction. So here, what we are trying to do today is to give you those eyes and see where that magnifying lens detail So that's going to be our agenda today. Uh, we are going to be dividing this entire session into two parts. First, I'm quickly going to be running through all the specific regulations that are going to be applicable into uh, the balance sheet perspective. Uh, I would say 95% of the rules would have some or the other impact 
in the uh, either in the pnl item or in the balance sheet item so we'll try and understand that quickly and then we have uh, kept the entire uh, ppt and the session on case study basis we'll try and pick up each and every item of the balance sheet and discuss on what can be the potential cases that have happened and all the cases that have been discussing in this uh, presentation are all actual cases that we have gone through uh, with our clients and what are the specific cases situations wherein you know either the auditor or the officers in charge the directors or the other uh, key players of the transaction have missed upon and hence defaulted on the fema regulation so our objective would be to know and understand and uh, be more satark here i would like to use the dialogue of saudan india ki jaano aur zyada satark ho jao that's what we'll try to do it today so here uh, uh, hum auditors ki baat kare aur hum sections ke bare mein na bole so that would be a little incomplete so here are a couple of sections uh, of companies act which will say that why we as an auditor are should be looking into it so agar aap companies act ke appointed auditors ho ya income tax के ऑडिट कर रहे हो या आई वुड से यू आर एडवाइजिंग अ क्लाइंट ऑन एनी पर्टिकुलर मैटर एज अ प्रोफेशनल आई वुड से बियॉन्ड द लॉ इट इज ऑल्सो इम्पॉर्टेंट दैट वी आर अवेयर ऑफ ऑल दी अलाइड लॉज ऑल्सो बियॉन्ड द कंपनीज एक्ट इनकम टैक्स एक्ट विच आर द बेसिक एक्ट विच यूजली बिकम्स एप्लीकेबल टू द क्लाइंट बट वी शुड ऑल्सो बी अवेयर ऑफ द अलाइड लॉज बिकॉज लॉज लाइक फेमा वेन नॉट यू नो डिलीजेंटली फॉलोड और डिफॉल्टेड अपॉन द लाइबिलिटी कैन बी प्रिटी हाई on the company on the officers in charge uh, on the you know of, on the officers in charge and the related parties to the transaction so let's move to the to a couple of regulations that become applicable here uh, first of all uh, the current and the capital account transactions uh, i will just take uh, 15 to 20 seconds and i would like to know from the audience if you can just message me on the chat box and let me know how many of you have previously dealt with fema if you have ever dealt with fema in your career please post a yes in the chat box so that i will you know keep my conversation to chris if not please post a no so that i know and i'll go a little one liner in detail and try and explain of each transaction or each regulation so that the audience is benefited from what we communicate today okay i am having a mixed uh, answer but obviously a lot more moving towards no so let me quickly uh, take uh, 10 seconds and explain each transaction or each regulation as well so first of all is the current and a capital account transaction now what do we mean by a current account transaction uh, again since we are auditors i will today use a lot of terminology which we as auditors would be using in from the balance sheet and the pnl perspective that will be our barometer जिसको हम फॉलो करेंगे आज के सेशन के लिए सो करंट अकाउंट ट्रांजेक्शन आर बेसिकली दो ट्रांजेक्शन विच विल बी समे और दर अफेक्टिंग माई प्रॉफिट एंड लॉस अकाउंट इफ यू आर डीलिंग इन एनी ट्रांजेक्शन लाइक रॉयल्टी नो हाउ कमीशन टेक्निकल फीस एनी काइंड ऑफ एन एक्सपेंस ये सारे हमारे पीएनएल में जाके बैठते हैं दैट्स वाई देर बी करंट अकाउंट ट्रांजेक्शन एंड वेन एवर यू आर सपोज टू एडवाइज ऑडिट और रिव्यू एनी सच ट्रांजेक्शन बेटर गो टू एफ ई में करंट अकाउंट ट्रांजेक्शन रूल्स टू थाउजेंड सिमिलरली ऑल दो ट्रांजेक्शन जिसकी इफेक्ट हमारे बैलेंस शीट में आके बैठती है दो अकाउंट ट्रांजेक्शन विल बी कॉल्ड एज कैपिटल अकाउंट ट्रांजेक्शन एंड दो नीड्स टू बी रिव्यू अंडर द कैपिटल अकाउंट ट्रांजेक्शन रेगुलेशन टू थाउजेंड नेक्स्ट कम्स दी फॉरन डायरेक्ट इन्वेस्टमेंट सो करंट एंड कैपिटल आर वेरी वेरी ब्रॉड फिगर्स एनीथिंग विच फिक्स यूर बैलेंस शीट जैसे कि कैपिटल also is a part of your balance sheet and uh, loans is also a part of your balance sheet those both will be called as capital account transaction further hum jab usko detail mein scrutiny karte hain they've been divided into foreign direct investment which will somewhere or the other go and sit into your capital account so there are a couple of rules because there has been last 3 years there has been a quite an amendment and changes that has come up in this regulations and is uh, foreign exchange management non debt instrument rules 2019 if you are dealing with uh, borrowings and lending which is also generally called as ecb that has also changed recently in last couple of years and there is an ecb framework which has come in which talks about what is allowed not allowed and a detailed description has been given there in terms of borrowing from india or 
uh, borrowing in uh, giving you know lending from india and in terms of both foreign currency or indian rupees both are covered and in terms of fdi be it whatever kind of instrument which are convertible uh, compulsorily convertible into equity will form part of fdi the ones which do not compulsorily convertible form part of ecb but somewhere or the other fall into your balance sheet so that entire regulations which are applicable in each transactions we have kept it here at one place to make it handy for the users next comes uh, इंडिया में तो बहुत पैसा लेके आ गए अब बाहर जाने की बात भी करते हैं सो एज वी ऑल्सो सी दैट देर इज अज यू नो बींग ग्लोबलाइजेशन बींग इन प्लेस एवरी स्मॉल एंड बिगर कंपनी नाउ वॉन्ट्स टू डू बिजनेस इज आउटसाइड इंडिया वी हैव टेकन अप लेक्चर अ कपल ऑफ मंथ बैक ऑन ओडीआई विच इज कॉल एज ओवरसीज डायरेक्ट इन्वेस्टमेंट एंड अ वेरी यूनिक परस्पेक्टिव केम टू आर नोटिस दैट मोस्ट ऑफ द कंपनीज today want to have businesses either in us or dubai or singapore this have become the hub and uh, financial hub or business hubs and there are a couple of sectors who are thriving into this country so if whatever regulations you know mostly from india perspective that becomes your subsidiary or a jv in those cases they will sit into your investment category or your asset category of the balance sheet and which is where odi regulations needs to be looked into odi regulations are important not only for a private limited company or a limited liability partnerships or a partnership firm but also for individuals because rbi bahut meherban raha hai bolega agar aap individual ho aur aapko ja ke abroad mein business karna hai to bhi hum aapko allow karenge which is why from an auditor's perspective it becomes important that an individual's balance sheet may also have an odi picture coming into place Uh, because of the lrs transactions being allowed and hence uh, keep your eyes open even if you are doing the audit or even if you are reviewing an individual's balance sheet the last transaction we're going to be talking about is the import export of goods and services uh, india is um, the third largest economy and abhi bhi hum aage ja rahe hain bahut news mein hai humne uk ko peche bhej diya or more coming into front so a lot is contributed by the exports uh, done from india and which is where uh, i think more than 60% of the companies jo aap audit kar rahe honge usme export regulations kahin na kahin applicable honge ya what wo companies import kar rahe honge to import regulations will be applicable which is where it is important that we know the import and export regulations also they have their own criteria in terms of what are the timelines within which the uh export uh, should be realized what are the forms we need to file in case you are falling under a specific category of export transaction what are the restrictions in terms of import uh how much is there a limit to the import that needs to be done what if we have not able to make the import payments and there is a delay what in case you know you want to take some uh, supplier credit or you are importing a capital goods and a lot of time we also have queries yeah. coming in from companies who say hum log एक्सपोर्ट के लिए नहीं पर हम सैंपल्स भेजते हैं और वी आर गोन बी पार्टिसिपेटिंग इन द एग्जिबिशन सो दिस आर ऑल क्वाइट कॉमन ट्रांजेक्शन नाउ इन यू वॉन्ट हैव आंसर्स रिलेटिंग टू दोज द एक्सपोर्ट एंड ऑफ गुड्स एंड सर्विसेज रेगुलेशन इज योर गो टू रेगुलेशन फॉर द सेम मास्टर डिरेक्शन ऑल्सो हेल्प यू विद द सेम थिंग एंड वेन यू टॉक अबाउट द टाइम लाइन विद इन विच द रिसिप्ट एंड पेमेंट नीड्स टू बी दैन there's a the specific regulation one thing very important to understand under fema is that whenever we are advising fema ka regulation it is required to be read in wholesome and in conjunction with each other because kai bar aisa lagta hai humne sirf rules pad ke guidance de diya ki ye to usme nahi mention tha so it must have been allowed but there's a lot of default that happens there because kai bar rules mein nahi hota aur regulations mein mention hota hai so whatever provisions we are mentioning here besides each transaction type please make sure you refer to all of them and at the same time they are updated because uh, uh, though rbi has grown and they are you know trying to regularize a lot of stuff yet they are not in parallel with the uh, income tax act jitna income tax ka updated uh, circular milna aasan hota hai utna hi rbi ki side pe ghum ke updated प्रोविजन समझना थोड़ा सा डिफिकल्ट होता है एटलीस्ट फॉर द न्यू कमर्स एंड हेंस माय एडवाइस वुड बी के ट्राई एंड फाइंड द लेटेस्ट वर्जन ऑफ द रेगुलेशन नो व्हाट इज द मोस्ट इवेंट्स यू गो टू द रेगुलेशन दे टेल यू व्हाट्स द लास्ट अपडेटेड वन चेक दैट 
go through all the rules and regulations that are interlinked to each other and then advise your client or then make sure that you know we have uh, all things in place now i will move to the core of the transaction that we are here to discuss upon which is um, the balance sheet perspective uh, balance sheet se shuru karte hai and wahan pe bhi uh, we we'll like to begin with the shareholders funds which is the most common uh, area and 80% of the times when you will have a transaction uh, you know a foreign investment being involved this is an area that needs to be looked into so first of all what does it cover so share capital includes uh, uh, you know every instrument which is compulsory convertible that is very very important to make sure that we understand this difference and hence equity capital compulsory convertible preference shares compulsory convertible debentures uh any other instrument which is compulsorily uh, convertible and why i'm using any other instruments because we chartered accountants and lawyers are very very innovative to come up with new instruments which can be you know satisfy the needs of our investors and our companies and hence that uh, caveat is what i'm putting but any convertible and a compulsory convertible instrument is uh, a part of the shareholders agreement is a part of the equity share capital and that is where regulations needs to be lived into if we talk about so these are all covered under the foreign direct investment regime uh, if there is a indian company which is receiving fund from a foreign company or individual in that case form fc gpr needs to be filed within the due dates that has been mentioned uh, as per the law but if there is so if the money comes in the company fc gpr filing is required to be done but if there is a transaction wherein one of the shareholder is selling the shares to a non resident or a non resident is selling the shares to a resident which means there is a transaction between two shareholders and no funds are coming into the company in that transaction also uh, form fc trs needs to be filed because there is a foreign leg involved uh, thirdly whenever there is an indian company which is issuing esops to its foreign employees in that case also form esop needs to be filed all these transactions that i just spoke of would have an impact in the balance sheet and if you see that the client has undergone any of this transaction during the period of audit we need to make sure that they have complied of that transaction uh, further if it is an llp uh, in that case there is form fdi llp1 and fdi llp2 which needs to be filed to make sure that the transaction of equity is recorded means the fdi transaction comes into picture uh, i would like to bring here a case study on balance sheet uh, we had a client who was based out of uh, rajasthan and they were into hospitality sector what had happened in is that the client had received the funds uh, into the company but there were three shareholders and the funds was received by from only one of the shareholder the other two shareholders had not contributed and now the company was supposed to uh, issue shares to all the three shareholders and the compliance was required to be done now the question was uh, that how do you do the compliance of a transaction wherein only one of the shareholders has sent the money and the others have not sent so the first point that as an auditor we will have to look into is whether this kind of a transaction is allowed or not allowed can we have some views from the audience present here have they ever come across this case uh, what is your view whether it is allowed please drop a message on the chat and say yes allowed if you think that if a shareholder is putting in money but the shares will be all allotted to the other two shareholders who have not put in the money okay we have arvin here who says no not allowed करना है तो पैसा डालो तो ही अलाउ करेंगे वरना एफबीआई नहीं करेंगे ओके दैट्स योर व्यू सोलोमन आल्सो सेज नो नॉट अलाउड ओके दलिशा सेज अलाउ करेंगे इंडिया है पैसा आने दो नो प्रॉब्लम एट ऑल फिर देखते हैं कंप्लायंस कैसे करना है दैट्स दलिशा हु सेज यस अलाउड ओके आई लाइक टू हैव वन वन और टू मोर व्यूज व्हाट डू यू थिंक एंड प्लीज फील फ्री टू कम्युनिकेट वाया द चैट बॉक्स बिकॉज़ दिस इज समथिंग व्हिच यू मे कम अक्रॉस वेरी सून टू Saurav says yes. Santanam says no. Okay, I'll make sure I'll keep less Hindi. 
Okay, so now what happens here is that uh, uh, first of all, the RBI provision says that uh, nowhere it is mentioned that you are not allowed. Uh, but if you want to do it, there is a compliance, there is a process that needs to be followed. So in this case, it was allowed. Uh, the uh, the one of the shareholder has put in money. All you needed was an NOC, uh, a consent from the uh, one of the uh, investing partner saying, I have no objection to you issuing to the company, issuing the shares to the other two shareholders who have not contributed. When you also file from FCGPR, at that same time, also you need to make sure that uh, you, know, you have a separate checkbox which says that please confirm whether the payment has been received from the uh, investee or it is from somebody else. So that checkbox needs to be uh, ticked in saying that no, the funds have come from somebody else. Now, this was a case wherein the funds had come in during the period of somewhere around 2008-2012. And what happens or the trick is, so first step we said yes, allowed. But the challenge comes up here is that there is a KYC document that needs to be uh, produced and that KYC document needs to be filed when you do the form FCGPR filing. So what happened was that since the other two parties had not shared the money into the Indian account, they were not able to, uh, I mean, the bankers were not able to give us the, uh, the KYC for the other two shareholders. Now, unless we receive the KYC, we cannot do the filing. So what happened was uh, when we got this company, we realized that the company had issued allotted the shares since 2012 onwards, but till 2020, they had not done any reporting, not only because they were not able to get it, bankers were not able to support the transaction because they don't have the funds, so they weren't able to issue the KYC. And without the KYC, the company wasn't able to uh, go ahead and do the filing. So this was a practical challenge that they faced. Uh, this challenge even exists today. So whenever you are advising your clients on this point, you need to be very, very sure that you have your banker in confidence in advance and make sure how will you solve the issue with respect to the KYC. Though it is permitted, allowed and happening, but better to have that in place. Uh, so here if those reporting, if those years in which the money was received and the reporting is not happened, not taken place, as an auditor, we are supposed to report that transaction in our report. At the same time, uh, all those transactions relating to FIRC copies, the inward remittance certificate copies, the FCGPR or the FCTRS filing copies needs to be hard copy, soft copy needs to be along with the approval. Please make sure not only the filing copies, but the approval letters that has been received from RBI needs to be kept on record and with the company for like n number of years. We had one recent case wherein RBI was asking for this document like what before 30 years, you know, before 30 years the transaction was done and RBI asked us to share the approval copy of the transaction. So there is no time bound limit for ArtSal or anything. Please keep those transaction approval letters safe. Uh, as an auditor, as I mentioned, we need to make sure that the receipt of the, you know, of that uh, FIRC has been reported if uh, it was for a prior period and whatever current dated compliances are required, they are in place. The next important uh, area that needs to be audited and looked upon is the external commercial borrowing part of it. Now, uh, the, the balance sheet would have a current and a, no, sorry, a secured loan and an unsecured loan. Uh, but for us, the most important lookout here is it is an external commercial borrowing and it can be from a non-resident shareholder also if he falls within the category of the recognized lender and hence an external commercial borrowing and the regulation needs to be looked into. And the second part, what needs to be done, the filing that are the important filings is if the transaction is under the approval uh, automatic route, you need to have form ECB filed and the LRN should be in place. Uh, that is a loan registration number, a unique number which is being provided once RBI knows that this transaction has been taken into account. So the LRN should be in place and every month form ECB2 needs to be filed, which needs to be approved or signed by the auditor. Uh, before 7th of the month, they need to file it. 
now uh, most probably it becomes very important that the company's auditor is aware because unko they need to do this uh, reporting regularly every month as i mentioned and the fema borrowing and lending regulation or the ecb framework should be your go to do, to know whether whatever has been done is in line with the law or not and the, again on this front it is import liabilities if there is any import payment that needs to be done uh, current account rules and transactions needs to be looked into and the payment outstandings will be visible in the trade payable section we'll look at the case study relevant for each of its transactions now now here was a very very interesting case uh, this was the company which was into a healthcare sector and coincidentally what happened was company had taken ecb in 2004 in foreign currency uh, now the balance was outstanding in the books and usually how we would do is you know during the end of the period you would convert the foreign currency loan into inrs uh, for the reporting purposes now what happened was wo inr mein it got converted and the auditor changed uh, for a good period of time there was another auditor and then again after 3 4 years a new auditor was appointed so we were appointed to do the due diligence of that balance sheet and we saw that there was a loan standing in the balance sheet and the loan had not changed since quite some years on for for the detailed scrutiny we realized that this was actually a foreign currency ecb that was taken but the auditor had converted into inr and had not mentioned any note in the balance sheet or notes to accounts about it being a foreign currency loan and hence the new auditor who came they saw that this was a inr loan which was being uh, carried forward from the previous year and without any ado they continued the inr loan at the same amount like for example 2 lakh dollar was converted into say 10 lakh rupees then for years together that 10 lakh rupee loan stood in the balance sheet of the company for more than like almost 15 20 years uh and only once when we were doing the due diligence we realized that it was not a, a foreign currency not an inr loan but a foreign currency loan so there was a default at two levels one uh the company never reviewed its balance sheet in detail and never understood that okay there was some uh, repurchase that was required to be done secondly the bigger default also happened was the company never filed the form 2 form ecb 2 which was earlier form 2 uh and monthly got it signed from the auditor otherwise the auditor would have still understood okay there is some foreign currency loan um at the same time the auditor never went ahead and checked in detail the agreement or the original transaction that was standing in the balance sheet and relied on the previous auditor's reporting and hence for quite some time the loan stood in the balance sheet of the company without any change only when they thought of repayment that is where or the due diligence happened that is where the entire transaction unearth so hence it is very important that if we are saying any foreign currency transaction happening in the ecb part of it we need to make sure first that the lrn is in place and that lrn copy needs to be taken into account second regular ecb to form needs to be filed third if uh, you also it is important to see whether that is within uh, that is under the automatic route or approval if it is under the approval route we need to have the approval copy in place now that was this with regards to the basis of the loan at the same time the ecb provisions has some feelings with with respect to the cost attached to the uh, ecb which means that how much interest or expenses with respect to the ecb needs to be uh, you know capped and that is as per the provision so whenever we are auditing in terms of interest payment also we need to make sure that they are following one the terms of the loan agreement and at the same time not contravening to the laws that has been mentioned of the ecb provision now this is uh, another case again with respect to the loans and advances now here in this case it was a petroleum gel trading company now the company had taken ecb in 2009 uh, in foreign currency and also in inr there were two transactions in which the company had taken loan uh, but uh, at the time what happened was they had not applied for the lrn and uh, they went ahead and completed the transaction the transaction was live for a couple of years uh, but after uh, i think 6 years or 8 years or so they wanted to make the repayment so they went to the bankers once they went to the banker banker said are 
uh, you have uh, show us your lr and copy let us know the details of the ecb taken that is where the company realized that they have not taken and not done the compliances since the beginning so when the payment repayment was supposed to be done they were not allowed the repayment by the bankers which is where the company had to go ahead and now do the compliances for 2009 paper we have to go to the bank get the ecb submitted get the lr in place complete the compounding process finish all your default that are there and then only the company would be allowed to make the repayment so hence as an auditor as much as our liability is there at the time of fund coming into the company similar liability we have or similar our magnifying glass should come in when the company is making any repayment of any foreign currency loan or any loan that is being uh, in the books of the accounts or books of the company but given by a foreign company or a foreign bank or any kind of eligible lenders that are there in such scenarios we have to keep our antenna high now we move further to the asset side and realize what more areas of the balance sheet are there which where fema transactions can come into account so one is investment in subsidiaries and associates as we all know now we are talking about the odi part of it which is the overseas direct investment if any indian company or a, par a partnership firm or an llp we call them as indian entity any indian entity wants to open up a company outside india and wants to do a business which are eligible then in those cases form odi is required to be filed prior to doing the transaction and the oi rules which is the overseas investment rules and regulations will become applicable in such circumstances as i had also mentioned that if you are doing or reviewing the balance sheet of an individual then in that case the investment that is made by an individual in the uh, overseas entities in such scenarios the liberalized remittance scheme will also become applicable and yet the provisions of form form f odi needs to be filed with the ad bankers so um, that's the odi form that needs to be filed uh, odi form also needs to be filed into different transaction types like for example you have opened up a company form odi you need to file suppose that you are making any changes you know you are you are disinvesting that time also odi needs to be filed uh, further once you have an odi in place in the company every year 31st of december you need to file an annual performance report how your foreign company is performing so rbi is interested in knowing that and hence form apr needs to be filed so as an auditor we need to make sure that this forms are also filed within the timeline if not they needs to be reported further form fla needs to be filed that is the foreign liability and assets statement needs to be filed uh, every year in the month of july which talks about the liability statement of the overseas entity so these are the three forms that needs to be filed wherein a odi transaction comes into picture um again let's understand what what is the kind of transaction that can happen in terms of the investment rotera so this is an example of a listed pharmaceutical companies yes pharmaceutical companies can also have this troubles or listed companies can also have this trouble odi is an area where in uh, the compliances are yet physical if we talk about form fcgpr which is an fbi part of it the forms and the transactions have now become digitized uh, whereas that is not the case in terms of uh, uh, the odi transactions yet there is paper filing that needs to be done in case of odi and hence uh, i'm sure the practicing people are aware that there are so many places where in today there are uh, uh, you know potential for error that is happening a couple of times we know the cases where you know we have filed odi bankers have lost it it's not being updated at times the number there can be you know manual errors while putting in the number the transaction number are not reported at its correct amount so there are such uh, errors happening and hence especially one needs to be more uh, prudent when they are looking at the odi transaction uh one of our cases that we had gone through was there was an investment in uh in three different countries the investment was done by the listed entity and they had given all types they had given investment that is equity that given loan that given guarantee to its foreign subsidiary but the financials 
were not matching with the RBI records. Now, how do you come to know about the RBI records? I said that bahut mismatches are there. A lot of transactions are not reported. Are you guys aware? How will you come to know whether our reporting has been reflected in the books of RBI in the correct manner? If anybody from the participants are aware, what is it that you should be looking into? Or where will you come to know that uh, you know the records are not proper? Because we are the auditor hai, and we want to cross-check. You know, that's what we do. Tick, check here and check there. We need to have two documents to match. So one is our books of accounts, wherein we know, okay, what is it uh, that uh, is being that what is it that we have uh, proposed to show to RBI? So that's available in our books of account. Uh, Vikas Thakur is mentioning firms portal. No Vikas, as I said that FDI, the invert transactions are recorded in the firms portal and that has become digitalized. So yes, a couple of things available in the entity master in the digital form. So we come to know what RBI knows about us, but ODI part is yet not digitized on our end. Obviously on the RBI end, they have their digital form, but front end, it is not yet digitized. We are still submitting the hard copies. So no, it's not on the firm's portal. Any other views? Because unless we know where to look into, which document to, how we will even know that yes, there is an error here or things are not reported correctly here. <clears throat> yes, so there is a document which is called as project profile report. Uh, or a short form called as PPR. So a company needs to file, uh, whenever the company files any documents with the RBI, and when it is updated in the RBI's record, they have it in the PPR with the project profile report, which is very similar to a ledger balance, wherein whatever we have submitted is available in the books. So as an auditor, if your company is having ODI, it is suggested that we ask them on an annual basis to ask for the project profile report from the banker. Our experience has been that any time, rather I would say maximum number of times, whenever you ask for a project profile report and you will definitely see some or the other error. If your entity is quite active in terms of their investments or disinvestments or transactions with the foreign company, because that ledger clearly shows about your loans category, your amount that you have invested, the kind of guarantee that you have given is completely reflected in the uh, project profile. Even how many years APR you have filed, if you have missed any APR is all reported. So it is safer to ask for that report. In our case, when uh, the transaction, you know, or rather the assignment began, when we realized that there was a mismatch in the record, uh, according to us, our equity investment was higher compared to what was being reflected in the RBI record. Uh, your savior, would be as I had mentioned that if you have the acknowledged copy of the ODI form or the APR form that you have submitted with the bank, that comes to your savior. If you submit it to RBI or to the banker, they may use that to update their books of accounts or their record. But if we do not have those signed or acknowledged copies with us, in that scenario, RBI and the bankers will make us do the entire filing again and might be considered that it is our default. Hence, I suggest it is advisable to keep that record and have a regular check on it because the number of days or the years that it is delayed, obviously it has an impact in terms of penalty on the entity also. Again, here, this was a case wherein, you know, it was again a listed company, um, almost a 6,000 crore big company, but yet uh, that company, now what happened is, when one more transaction situation wherein you know this comes into account is merger or demerger this happening maybe there is no merger demerger of it can be a demerger on a merger of your entity or it can also be in a merger demerger situation of a global uh, level you know a holding company level there is some change in the transaction and hence the subsidiary level things are changing in such scenarios also a reporting needs to be mentioned or a reporting needs to be done. This is very important to know this because if you will go through the regulation, you will not find any specific regulation topping, uh, talking that you know in this situation, uh, you know, a reporting needs to be done and what form needs to be filed. But we need to understand that at any point in time, if there is change in any shareholding of the foreign subsidiary for whatever reason, 
it is important that the same needs to be reflected to RBI. And hence, wo, you know, uh, there should be a light bulb moment for us as auditors that let me see what would be applicable here and check whether that compliances have been done or not. <clears throat> now we move to the another aspect, which is, you know, the fixed asset part of it. Um, and the fixed asset part may involve, you know, acquisition of any immovable property outside India, especially I'm talking in terms of an individual. That if an individual is buying a property uh, outside India, it is very important as not only as an auditor, but also as a professional that we guide our clients correct. Uh, earlier, there were a lot of cases wherein, you know, uh, people were defaulting, especially in this provision because of the EB-5 case, you know, for the visa purposes. Uh, and then recently, RBI has come up with the circular and trying to make that provisions more difficult. Hence, if there is an immobile property acquisition being happening, it is important that we look into the OI rules because that covers the immobile property regulations also. Further, now, if the Indian company has given an equity investment outside India, it will get covered under the investment criteria. But if the Indian entity has given any loan or advance to the foreign entity, uh, though the OI rules will be the same that becomes applicable but uh, the reflection of it in the balance sheet may change from investment to you know a short term loan or anything but we need to make sure that the oi rules that are applicable would remain the same in such case and we need to follow the same and the compliances of the same uh, are also the same for it we move further to uh, uh, on other aspects which is say a trade receivable now export proceeds as I mentioned, are the most important regulations when it comes to trade receivables. And the most important two major uh, areas that needs to be looked into, one is the timeline that needs to be others. Uh, the timeline uh, are more or less constant, but due to COVID, there were fluctuations. So I would suggest that every time you are auditing, you us to go back to the provision and check on the latest uh, available timeline that has been provided. Uh, second case, which usually also comes up in the export process is third party. A lot of time people have this question that can we ex accept an export payment from a third party? So RBI has allowed that transaction, but in uh, subject to a certain condition. So make sure that if you're referring to any of those conditions, uh, you know, such a transaction is being audited or is a part of the financial year. Uh, make sure that you see that those transactions are as per the guidelines or allowable uh, you know permissions are given then only third party transactions are permitted uh, third uh, again the area that needs to be looked into is somewhere wherein what if the uh, the default is there or the export process have not been received within the timeline again this uh, provision has been very very elaborative which talks that okay go to banker and take an extension uh, till what time the extension is permitted and what if it is not permitted, you need to go ahead and, you know, what further actions need to be taken. What I'm doing here is I'm not trying to say exact provisions because I'm sure uh, you may not remember all of it right now. And we don't know when this will be applicable. But what we try to do is make you connect to the relevant provision or the regulation that you need to refer whenever you are doing the audit of the transaction. And hence, as I said, that any export related transaction, please go ahead and read the export regulations, which will give you the clarity on whether what is allowed and what is not. The second part comes up is the cash and the bank balance. Again, here, uh, not everybody is allowed to keep a foreign currency account in India. So if your client is asking for it, go ahead and check whether it is allowed or not. Uh, question also comes for Indian uh, uh, individuals, you know, a lot of HNI. Uh, and a lot of other companies, uh, individuals who want to or, or have their businesses uh, abroad, they say that we have earned the money in foreign currency. Can we keep it in foreign currency there abroad uh, or not? So I am sure a lot of people, if you would have read the newspapers, uh, March period, you know, there was a lot of uh, people coming up in a news uh, in the print, print media or social media was that. Now the timelines are getting over. It is only six months that any individual is allowed to keep the money in its foreign bank account. If either you need to invest it in foreign, which is also permitted, or if you are not investing, make sure you are bringing in the funds back to India 
within 180 days otherwise you will be start contra gana so if in your balance sheet you are seeing any foreign currency bank and you are seeing a balance in it uh, make sure you see that you know either it gets invested or check whether the timelines have been other to or not uh, if there is a foreign branch that is in place the foreign branch regulations needs to be looked into again the contingent liability part also is important which is the guarantee part of it a uh, guarantee gets covered a lot into the oi rules but it has its own separate regulations also which needs to be looked into after all of this if there is any compounding proceedings that means the client has already defaulted and he is going to rbi suo moto or the proceedings are going on or uh, rbi has asked to do the compounding it is better to have the process the reporting of the compounding being in place in your uh, notes to account that was all with respect to the balance sheets now we will try and move on towards the pnl part of it now in pnl again as i said sales will be morely driven on export sales uh, export sales one of the important things in export sales is how would you route your transaction what are the documentation that needs to be submitted with the bank which is generally we don't find a default there because uh, unless their document submissions are done well they are have a trouble in receiving the funds most probably we have not seen that as an auditor we have to give our comments anything there but at the same time if you are doing an export of a specific transaction wherein you know reporting like needs to be done in soft tax that is where we see that yes at times there is a default that might have happened so that needs to be looked into what other transactions can be is interests can be one of the areas that may have a uh, maybe sitting to the credit of the pnl interest on loan to foreign entities the other areas can be uh, you know if you want to write off bad debts agar book karna hai especially in respect to the export data then rbi says boss you cannot just go ahead and uh, book the data and say bad debts ho gaya uh, because it's a indian uh, deficit you know that increases so there is a limit to which only uh, export realization can be written off only that much limit you can write off rest as an auditor we cannot allow that bad debts to be written in the books of accounts without the rbi permission being in place those regulations have been mentioned again in the export of goods and services again this write off is a lot of lot common and uh, more query that comes up because uh, there is default and there are uh, you know disputes that comes into picture which is where uh, the entity or the company would request the auditors that please allow us a write off as an auditor it is important that we check that whether it falls within the allowable criteria which is under the automatic route or the entity needs to be advised to go to rbi and take the approval for the uh, writing off of the export realization then it is the interest on loan which is received from or which needs to be paid to the foreign entity again this is very similar to as i mentioned on the ceilings cost ki ceilings ho gayi tds deductions hoga that needs to be taken into under the borrowing and lending regulations any other miscellaneous remittances which gets covered under the current account regulations uh, royalty payment agar hai again getting covered under the current account regulations these are just a few common uh, categories that comes into picture again um, a case study so let's say an example where uh, this was about a waste management company and they had booked they had all the invoices and hence the auditor had booked the royalty payment and insurance cost that was required to be paid to the uh, parent company uh, now this was since the period of 2004 that it was standing in the balance sheet they they had deducted tds booked the books of account but they had not made the payment now the payment was outstanding Since uh, almost 15 years. Now, post 15 years, now the company wanted to make the payment. What first role that uh, auditor had to do was report that this is a payment which is required to be done, but it has not been done since so many years. And uh, the auditor continuously for n number of years reported it in his books of accounts, in the notes to accounts, and then finally made sure that the company took RBI permission. for making that payment because since it was a long delayed payment rbi permission was required to be made and only post that the payments were released to the company we need to make sure that proper tax has been deducted from those payments 
they have been done within the timeline if there is a delay or so we need to report it in our uh, reports uh that's all uh, for now uh, this is um, a group a whatsapp group wherein we discuss such more critical cases of our fellow members uh, and all of us contribute uh, to the group so if you guys wish to be a part of the group you can scan the qr code and join the group and i hope this session was helpful and we could make it more interesting on the cases that were into i would quickly now take up the questions that are there in the chat box and the q and a if you have any more questions around it feel free to post it um now there is the question with regards to what is the timeline for the export proceed uh, to receive in case of goods as well as the services so the timeline uh, that is there is 6 months but as i mentioned the timeline keeps on changing a bit so there has been an update on the timeline front i may not be knowing it uh, over the tongue right now so i would suggest to go back to the export uh, rules and know the fresh date but yes it is the export of goods and services rules and the realization of payment uh, rules that needs to be looked into to know what is the exact timeline that needs to be followed upon uh whether payment of royalty will be covered by the timeline provided for payment for imports that is 6 months and such deferred payments period provided under the master direction yes as i just uh, discussed uh, one of the case and it was related to uh, royalty payment only wherein it there was a delay beyond the timeline that was prescribed in which case we had to take the specific permission an application was filed with the ad bankers and on scrutiny they decided whether that case should be referred to rbi or they would give an approval at their end to allow the transaction to be remitted uh, in our case the rbi permission was required to be taken and and only then the permission was sent uh, the now there's a question the shares must be issued with the market value yes uh, there are pricing guidelines that also needs to be taken into account when the fdi transactions are being done which means that the pricing guidelines are mentioned in the fdi rules at what price the transaction should happen secondly a uh, valuation report should be in place please note that under fema the valuation report of a chartered accountant is a valid report a registered valuer's report is not valid at the same time under companies act a registered valuer's report is a must and hence usually we would find that if there is a transaction relevant to fbi a chartered accountant and a registered valuer's report is taken into account to make sure that the timeline is there is there a period to return the trade payable to inter company now if the inter company is within india then it is a local transaction and no timeline or no fema would be coming into picture but if that inter company is outside india it will still get covered under the ecb regulation and i am sure that inter company if it is only shareholder so obviously you talking about uh, the loan transaction and ecb regulation ke hisab se whatever are the terms of your agreement needs to be followed uh hi ma'am i have a doubt whether lsf can be paid out of ecb proceeds a oh, very very interesting thing uh ecb proceed you want to use it for the lsf amount uh i'm not sure as of now because there are uh, if you are using it for i mean what is the purpose of your ecb proceed if it is for working capital purposes then lsf can also be a part of a expense a normal expense of the company and hence if you have taken the ecb for working capital then i think lsf could be paid out of ecb proceed but end use is something which you will have to look into before deciding whether lsf can be paid or not uh, fctr is filing is mandatory or not in case share swap non cash transaction uh, yes if it is a non cash transaction but between an nr and an r non resident and a resident or a resident and a non resident fctr is filing is required even in case it is gifting it is required so make sure you do the filings in place can import payables for goods 
B offset against export receivable for services. Uh, ex against good good is only uh, you know a set off. But again, to be more specific to your transaction, I said there is a specific uh, provision which is there for uh, setting off of import receivable and payable. Again, there are conditions like you know it should be from uh, the same company only. There should be uh, a couple of other transactions. Other you know uh, requirements that needs to be fulfilled. So I suggest we go back to the import and export regulations. In that there is a specific provision which is relating to the set off. Please go to that set off and see if your transaction can fit all those criteria that has been mentioned in it. A private limited company has made payment for imports. However, while clearing goods at the time of custom, the goods are cleared in director's name. What action can be taken for regularization as import is already done? Um, see if the transactions has happened via the company, uh, then the company's books will be have to be reflected uh, in uh, the company's books will be reflected and uh, the EDPMS, which uh, talks about the import regulations and EDPMS is a software where all imports that are made by the company gets recorded. You need to make sure that the EDPMS software knocks off the payment against the import that is done. What I'm understanding from your query is that your Payment is recorded in the EDPMS, but your import is not recorded. You will have to make sure that one leg you get it cleared. Either you uh, the clearing the you know, EDPMS software may you change or you call for the payment back, but that needs to be taken into account because right now if you don't do it, your transaction will be standing in the uh, books of RBI and that can create trouble. A number of more cases in one of our cases, we had saw more than 800 transactions were open. Whereas actually the payments were made or and the payments were, um, uh, sorry, not EDPMS, IDPMS. EDPMS is for export, IDPMS is for import, uh, but it stands in both the cases. Uh, I'm talking about wherein 800 transactions were outstanding shown in the books of accounts of the bank uh, because they were knocking it, not knocking it off regularly. Hence, if you are having auditing and export company, it is better to get a report of the EDPMS and check what is the outstanding entries. And make sure that every payment is being recorded in the banks and knocked off against the export which is done, vice versa the imports which is made, so that you don't have a trouble because lumbar outstanding ultimately gets you into trouble. I have just answered the question with regards to the same. Um, yes, IDPMS is for imports and IDPMS is for exports. Uh, I just missed on the INE front. But whatever are those transactions, make sure we are able to do that. Uh, Yusuf, I think we are about time and uh, I guess almost all questions are also over. So I would like to thank the audience. Thank you for this session and I hope I was able to add some value to everybody. Thank you so much. All right, ma'am. So thank you, Ms. Shah for an outstanding presentation and a clear and concise explanation of the subject matter. We greatly appreciate the effort that you've put into making this session a success. I would also like to extend my gratitude to the participants for their cooperation and contributions. We could not have done it without you. Although we have attempted to address all the queries raised during the session, please feel free to send any additional queries in writing to salesattaxman.com. Thank you all again. We look forward to presenting another vital topic to you soon. Until then, take care and have a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you, everybody.